Hi there, I'm Jason, and for some reason I make music as Sycamore Willow. And today I'm here to talk to you about tape saturation. I'm going to talk about what it is, what it sounds like, and how you can get that sound. So obviously you can get the sound of tape saturation from tape. But I'm also going to talk today about this device, the 15 IPS from DIY Recording Equipment, or DIY RE for short. So DIY Recording Equipment it has been making gear for a while now that's super affordable for home recordists and pros, and it achieves sounds that you'd normally, before this, would have paid thousands of dollars per channel to achieve. But they sell kits that you can assemble or you can pay them to assemble. And uh, they sound fantastic. In fact, I don't want to emphasize the price too much because basically they are very useful tools that sound great. Okay, I'll talk about them a little bit more later, but now let's really get into talking about tape saturation. Tape saturation happens when the tape runs out of particles to store all the information you're trying to record to it. And this happens on a spectrum. As you turn your input gain up from the left, the sound of the tape will go from clean and clear and unexciting, honestly, all the way through to fuzzy and mushy and maybe not useful. But there's a sweet spot up there towards the right end of the spectrum that sounds amazing. And that's why I like to use it for my mixes. My main use of my nice reel-to-reel -reel recorder that I'm going to be talking about today is to send mixes from my DAW to add the lovely sound of tape saturation. To get this, I generally like to drive the tape pretty hard and push the VU meters into the red in a way that might make you uncomfortable, especially in the digital realm where if you clip or go too far into the red, you'll get a really unpleasant splatty distortion. But with tape, it just sounds magical. The interaction of sound being driven through a reel-to-reel -reel DEX preamp, tape heads, and then onto tape does four things essentially. It creates harmonics, creates a low-end bump, softens harsh upper frequencies, and it creates compression. First, let's discuss harmonics tape tends to add what are called odd order harmonics. There are loads of videos explaining this, but I'll just do a really quick explainer. So I'm going to pretend like this is my frequency analyzer of sound going through it. So if you had a sine wave, a pure sine wave at 100 hertz, this is what it would look like. And that's what it would look like coming out of tape if it were not saturated, essentially, in theory. But then as you turn up the gain and get into the sweet spot, you would start to get little bumps at 300 hertz, 500 hertz, 700 hertz, 900 hertz, and so on. You'd get a little bump here, a little bump here, and so on. So that's a super scientific explanation, but let's talk about what it actually sounds like. The way I think of it is that it tends to add sparkle and like liveliness to a mix. When overdone, it gets harsh, but in the sweet spot, it makes for the nicest accentuation of top end frequencies. Now, let's talk about the next phenomenon, the low end bump. So there isn't a ton to explain here, but tape adds a little boost at around 60 hertz, and it almost always just sounds great. The character of this boost changes based on your tape speed though. I find that seven and a half inches per second is actually what I like best. When you go slower, it can get a bit too strong and it can sound a little murky. And faster, sometimes it's just not noticeable. Um, on really high quality tape machines, it is unnoticeable. Um, but since we like that bump, uh, you're sort of tempted to actually get a machine that actually has that sound. So one reason tape can be more effective than the EQ in your uh, DAW is because in combination with the harmonics adding sparkle and brightness, tape also prevents harshness. Most good machines have a frequency response that drops off sharply just above 20 kilohertz, which is actually the upper end of human hearing range anyway. So digital is essentially able to reproduce frequencies well above the hearing range. Tape essentially slams the door shut on very high frequencies. You can still record harsh sounds to tape, but the tape won't reproduce them above 20 kilohertz. Another super nice thing tape does is it adds compression. I won't talk too much about what compression is and how it works. That would be a whole other video. That said, when you saturate tape into the sweet spot, your mix will sound louder and have more impact. 
You'll hear the tails of reverbs better, and, and percussive transient sounds will have punch. All these phenomena are why so many people, like me, say that tape fixes a mix or makes it sound glued together. From a psychoacoustic perspective, this could be for a lot of reasons. The vast majority of music we've known in our lives until recently was recorded on analog equipment and tape, so we may think of these sounds as the norm. There may be a little bit of that going on, but maybe not for everyone, for people who are younger and have grown up since tape was the norm. But in general, I think these sounds are truly just pleasing. And in addition, I find myself having to work way less hard to get a mix to sound good if I just send it to tape. When I only stay in the digital realm, I might have to work more to EQ and compress each channel to get the sound I want. On the other hand, if I get sounds in my DAW to play together nicely and then send them the tape, it often just sounds done right after that. Okay, so how does one achieve this effect, tape saturation? So the obvious way is with a tape machine. But a good, quiet, and reliable tape machine can be big, expensive, and hard to maintain. I'm not here to try to talk you out of getting one. But if you're interested in owning a good reel-to-reel -reel deck, go in with your eyes open. Make sure you know a good tech and can get your hands on all the supplies you'll need to maintain and operate it. It used to be harder to find good quality tape, but now, thankfully, it's easier to get um, new tape than it was in the early 2000s. But if you don't have the money, space, or desire to own a tape machine, there are other ways to get this kind of effect. Also keep in mind a really nice tape sound can't be achieved with any old garage sale reel-to-reel -reel deck. Those are of course cool, but they can be lo-fi, and thus they're not useful for many kinds of music. Also today, I'm not here to talk about lo-fi tape sounds. Even though I like those sounds, I'm here to talk about another tool you should have in your toolbox as a musician and home recordist how you can get your recordings to have the sparkle and oomph of a good tape machine. So there are of course software plugins, many of which have a really pleasing sound, but to my ears don't 100% nail the sound of tape. That's fine. This isn't a diss. Again, just go with your eyes open. There are also loads of outboard hardware boxes to get nice tape saturation sounds. I'm thinking of devices like the Overstayer or the Empirical Labs Fatso. I've used those in studios in the past and they are very nice. But the funny thing is, is they cost more than my best reel-to-reel -reel deck that I own. But that said, they also take up less space, they require no tape, and are very, very low maintenance. These devices usually go for anywhere from $2,000 to $4,000. So here's where I'll talk about the 15 IPS from DIYRE. For as little as $250 per channel, you can get the sound of hardware tape saturation um, in a simulation of it anyway. So I don't want to emphasize the price too much because these units sound terrific and are absolutely pro. DIYRE has a platform they call Colors. Think of these as hardware analog audio plugins. Actually, that's literally what they are. DIYRE offers three different ways to deploy colors. Two of them are in combination with mic preamps and one is just a standalone color palette. Today, I'm gonna to show you the Color Duo which is the priciest of the three options, but in my opinion, a huge bargain, and it's incredibly useful. The other two they sell are 500 series modules. I won't go into them a ton, but if you're interested, I urge you to check out their website and consider uh, what works best in your home studio. To keep things simple today, I'm just gonna show you what I've got. So this device fits in my smallish studio rack and has two high gain, clean, and quiet mic pre's and accepts three colors per channel. This thing is pretty tricked out. It'll accept line levels, it has phantom power, a pad, an 80 hertz high pass filter. It's just really an incredibly useful studio tool. Anyway, the 15 IPS just plugs in like this. You'll notice I have other colors in here as well, just to quickly mention them. I have the CTX, which includes the revered Cinemag transformer, which you just drive with a really cool preamp. Uh, this is another kind of saturation I should go over in a future video. I also have this other color called Super Filter, which does a similar thing to the revered Pultec EQP1A. It has a really musical lift on the top end, air if you will, and a little bump at the low end. It doesn't sound exactly like the Pultec, of course, but it really, really sounds nice. So just by the way, Pultecs go for over $4,000 and this unit is $69, and you just pop it into this. As you can imagine, combining all these colors gives you lots of options, and they're all super useful. 
while tracking or mixing down. So a little sidebar about why I find tools like these useful as a musician and home recordist. As I compose, in addition to thinking about melody and how a piece is going to evolve over time, I think carefully about the sonic space each sound occupies. That's a weird sentence, so let me unpack it for a bit. For example, the sound a bass note makes typically can have percussive sounds that are actually in the upper registers of the frequency range, and these can clash with other sounds you have occupying those other registers from things like cymbals or the sound of an acoustic guitar string, etc., etc. My preference is to EQ those sounds out as I record if possible so I can really make sure the composition has what it needs to sound good and make the statement I want it to make. This is how tools like colors are helpful. They can do things like compress and pull out detail and clarity. They can also confine a sound to a smaller area to make room for other instruments. Or they can just totally destroy a sound. I choose studio equipment with the idea that these things become part of my composing process. And that's why these colors are so appealing to me and I have to talk myself out of buying a ton of them. Hey everyone, while I have you here, I want to mention that I have cassettes for sale of my album, The Last Memories. It's a short album of four tracks I made with my Vintage Rhodes piano, tape loops, blooper loops, and other effects pedals. I recorded it in the space of a weekend and later refined it with the help of my friend, Luke Elliott. I love writing little stories to describe what the music does in my imagination as I'm making it. The story I wrote for this is about memory and mortality. You can go check it out now at my band camp. So if you can, please consider supporting me by buying a cassette or digital version. The album is also on Spotify and YouTube, of course, but at Bandcamp, your support is more direct. Okay, back to talking about tape saturation. Okay, let's get to the good part, the listening. So I'm going to play the original track. This is a track I'm working on right now. Um, then I'm going to play the track that I sent to tape. And then I'm going to play the track that I sent through 15 nips. Um, just a warning, there's going to be pretty massive volume differences. Um, I thought about evening that out, but um, honestly just didn't want to put in the work. And to me, the, the sound differences just aren't subtle enough to worry about level matching. So first let's listen to the original track. Okay, now uh, let's listen to the tape version. Okay, so in that take, you can hear I'm pushing the tape pretty hard, uh, especially if you know what to listen for, you'll, you'll hear uh, it start to distort, but I found that musical. Uh, maybe you'll disagree. Some of the things I hear happening in that um, listening back compared to the original is that the bass remains really, really full and impactful at the low end but it actually weirdly sounds a little more contained. The original, the bass did feel a little too, like it was taking up too much of the frequency range and it felt a little out of control, but tape just somehow seems to like shape and tighten the bass up a little bit more. Maybe that's because the mix also got very compressed in a nice musical way. The compression to me, I could hear 
the percussiveness of those piano notes really well. And it's funny, you know, that's a sampled piano played through my OP1, and it still really brought it to life, really made the piano sound sound pleasing and not like I was plunking away on my OP1. Lastly, the top end gets really sweet and sparkly compared to the original. Um, you could maybe hear some of it roll off at the top. I don't know if um, I don't know if you can hear it through the YouTube, uh, you know, uh, compression they put on audio, but I can hear it roll it off a little at the top. I like the sound of that. Some people may prefer more precision up there at the top end, but uh, I enjoy it. Okay, let's listen to this going through 15 nips. I will warn you, I pushed it a little too hard, um, but I think it's enough to get a sense of what it does. Okay, so uh, if you want to think about that on your own for a minute, maybe hit pause and think about what you heard. Uh, but I'll just plunge right into my own comments about it. Um, I find that 15 Ips did almost the same thing with the bass that the tape did. It, it contains it, somehow makes it more impactful without like it sounding wild and out of control. In both of them, I almost got the sensation you get when you're like at a show and the bass hits you in the chest. The bass just really felt impactful to me. Um, it similarly did some nice things to the top end. Because I think I oversaturated it, I think I didn't get it as sweet as it could have been. But the one thing I will say that 15 Nips doesn't quite do the same as the sample we listened to just there of the tape is it didn't compress it as nicely. I didn't hear the same impact happening in the mid-range uh, from the piano notes, for example. But that said, it does some really, really nice things that could be useful still on mixes or individual tracks. Um, I really, really love it. It's such a useful tool. Okay, so hopefully you learned something about tape saturation today. If you still have questions, please leave them in the comments and I'll answer them there or maybe in a future video. You might be wondering, for example, why I have both a 15 Ips and reel-to-reel -reel recorder. Part of the answer is because I have a gear problem. I love finding and acquiring and playing with gear. But all these acquisitions I have are inspiring and they're tools in my creative toolbox to get me going. So for example, with the 15 Ips, I tend to use it during the sound designing and creation phase. It's in line with a mic pre, I'm running an instrument through it, and I'm crafting a sound that gets me excited, right? I might get super aggressive with the 15 nips, or I might just use it gently to pull things out of a tape loop or a synth that I think will sound really cool. Later, with the tape machine, I'll send the whole mix to it for a more subtle saturated effect that affects the entire mix. It's also worth mentioning that Working with the 15 Ips in line in a mic pre is a faster workflow, whereas the tape machine, it takes a little more effort to get it out, hook it up, thread the tape, find the levels, and that can sometimes slow down the creative process a little bit. Either is really good, actually, so they're just great tools to have in general. Anyway, I hope all of that is helpful, and thanks so much for watching.